Pastor, were you all hearing me sing? Because I think I had it on unmute. All right, cool. You took it out? Good. Man, everybody is grateful for that, Clay, for sure, for sure. Well, it was September 11th, 2001. Do you remember that date? 19 hijackers carried out their hateful and evil plan to attack our beautiful nation. 2,996 people lost their lives that day. 265 died on those four airplanes. So there's 200 or 2,606 that died inside the World Trade Towers and another 125 within the Pentagon. Among that number were 343 brave firefighters, 71 police officers also lost their lives. The overwhelming majority were U.S. citizens. However, a lot of times people forget there were actually 90 different nationalities represented that day and lives lost. And I look at that dark day that those planes were flown into buildings like missiles, and I, and I think about the darkness, I think about the sadness, but I also remember how this nation responded. Do you remember how we responded to that? It was quite incredible. A nation that is oftentimes divided and we have our hard lines. On that day, that next day, we actually came together. It was, although sad, it was somewhat of a proud moment that I will never forget. I remember uh, President George W. Bush, um, and it didn't matter what you thought of the man at the time. No matter, like everybody in the country loved this man in this moment as he stood here with that battery-powered bullhorn and, and just with tears coming down his cheeks. He was both filled with emotion, just being human, and at the same time strong and bold and saying, we will not let this go unnoticed. We will avenge these deaths. These people will be brought to justice. And for just a short season, it actually felt like we were one nation under God. There was this American patriotism that rose up within us, and it created a unifying effect. The stories that were shared. Do you remember how we did that? It, the, each person that lost their life, we, we took a moment, we, we looked at their picture, we told their story. We, we were enamored with knowing these, these brave people, especially the firemen and the, and the police officers. It was really an incredible moment in our history. And then you, you fast forward 19 years I don't know if you remember how 2020 went, but there was this thing called the coronavirus. Have you heard of it? Yeah, it, it hit us and it, it hit the country you know, pretty hard. It was another unforeseen tragedy. But this time, instead of a coming together, what we saw was further division. We saw disunity with COVID-19 and continued racial divisions. And then you, you add in the circus of political theater with it being an election year. And it was not a moment where we all came together. It was a time when we felt like we were torn apart. And let's just be honest, there were 500,000 plus people that have said that they, they died in either with this virus or because of this virus. And just the fact that I had to stop and clarify that and have a little bit of nervousness saying that statement describes the division that we're feeling in this country, right? Are you feeling it with me? It's just a confusing time. We don't know what we can say and can't say, but what we don't really know what to do is what do we do with these stories? You know, because we're like, well, if I, if I talk about the stories of someone dies, does that mean I'm leaving my other narrative, my preferred narrative? And, and how do I walk this line? How do, I, how do I use my social media platforms? I mean, back in 2001, we didn't have a lot of social media. I mean, some of you had a MySpace account, right? But there was this, like, we, we, the news outlets and, and the politicians came together. But this time around, the social media and the news outlets and the politicians all used the storylines to divide and to drive that wedge even further, creating division and hatred. And I think there's so many people who are angry and we look at deaths that have been politicized and it's frustrating and we don't know how to speak to it. But at church, I just want to give some warning here. We need to be careful that we don't know, forget how to, how to have compassion and kindness. The scriptures are clear. We're supposed to mourn with those that mourn. It doesn't matter how the storyline played out. If you can't mourn with those that are mourning, is the Spirit of God alive in you? You need to hear this today. It's possible to mourn 
500,000 plus deaths from a virus, even if you have suspicions about politicians and the narratives that they're creating. Are we being clear? Don't lose sight of the stories in the midst of your views and your preferences. It is possible to stand strong against racism and to stand for racial reconciliation without giving into culture's prevailing view of how we're supposed to get there. Are we clear? It's possible to take a stand. We can do both and we can pray at the same time for those that are hurting and those that are suffering and those that are oppressed while at the same time celebrating the thin blue line that offers protection to all of us. We don't have to choose these hard sides. The Spirit of God is willing to lead us into these tough conversations. You guys are looking at me like wide-eyed, like, whoa, he stepped right into it this morning. But hear me, this is my point. Division and hatred is not from God. Period. It's not from God. No matter which side of the aisle you're on, the worst part of it is when we participate in hatred and division rather than bringing unity and peace, our enemy is laughing his head off. He is victorious, or at least feeling victorious. He has us right where he wants us. And we need to know that that's his strategy. The enemy will do whatever he can to divide us to tear us apart because he knows that when Christian families, when Christian churches are unified, we are an unstoppable force. Do you know that's true? He knows that when we're on the same page and we're committed to God's word and God's word alone, we are a formidable force and he doesn't want that. So he comes against us to stir it up and to divide. Jesus told us in Matthew 12, a house divided cannot stand. And then later in that same passage, he tells us this, that when we are unified, that's the kind of power that can drive out demons. In fact, Paul gets into it a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. That word division in both passages is interesting. The, the Greek word there is schisma. It means to um, split. It's a division. It's a schism, a ripping or tearing apart. Paul is saying, Jesus followers, don't play there. (laughs) Don't play there. You, You don't let the enemy pull you apart. When you participate in hate speech, you're letting the enemy pull you apart. You're engaging in his play. We are called to stand firm, according to Ephesians 6. And we don't just stand firm individually. We stand firm as the body of Christ. So here we are again this week, part two, looking at our enemy from Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're told to sit here. This has been the illustration we've used from the beginning. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. This is where we sit. This is where we spend time knowing God, knowing his word, knowing his character so that we can walk by the spirit, walk in righteousness. He says, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling so that you can stand firm against the enemy. Young believers, understand this. You will never spend too much time here. You want to know how to walk in righteousness? Spend time right here. Soak it up. Learn it all. Get to know him because that's where the power to walk will be. That's where the power to stand will come from. We need to know, though, this morning, what battles are we fighting? I don't want us getting all this from Jesus and then coming out here and wasting our energy fighting battles that he didn't call us to fight in. Ephesians chapter 4, I think I covered that pretty well uh, a few weeks back. But I want to go back to verses 1 through 3, and I want you to hear it from Eugene Peterson's The Message Paraphrase. Listen to this. In light of all of this, right? Sit, walk, stand. In light of all of this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up here, Paul being in prison, a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk. Better yet, run on the road God called you to travel. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes Nowhere. I love that translation because, by the way, that's what a church looks like when they abandon the gospel message of salvation and start jumping into social causes. We just feed the poor. We'll just build them homes. You're like, Chris, are you against that? 
Not what I'm saying. I'm saying I don't want to send people to hell fat and happy. I, I don't want to send people, like, I don't want to build them a home here on earth while neglecting the fact that they're supposed to have a spiritual home forever in a place called heaven. Listen to this. Man-made remedies can never supplant God-sized solutions to sinful problems. I'm going to say that again because nobody wrote that down. Man-made remedies can never supplant God-sized solution to sinful problems. He goes on. And mark that you do this with all humility and discipline. Not in fits and starts, but steadily. Pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love. Alert and noticing differences and quick at mending fences. Again, I love this language because he's saying, be aware of the differences, Christian. You're not like those that are not Christian. You're, you're different. Clearly, you're different. You think differently. You have different ideas. You know what your life is all about. But don't get frustrated with them. I see so many Christians being frustrated with lost people for acting like lost people. What does he say to do? Mend fences. Yeah, I think that's the problem. None of you guys have ever done any work mending fences. How many of you have actually mended fences before? All right, we've got some farmers in the room. It's easy, isn't it? No, it's hard work. <laughs> Mending fences is hard work. He's asked us to go repair broken relationships. Go into broken families and bring the reconciliation of Jesus. Go into a broken world and bring the reconciliation of Jesus. This is the hard work of mending fences, but that is what we're called to do. And, oh, by the way, do it quickly. Be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are called the sons of God. So here we are in Ephesians 6, ready to be a leader, to battle, to stand firm in this evil world. He's called us to something, and he's given us, the king has given us the kingdom. We already have the territory. We don't need to go claim new land. He's given it to us. We have the robe, we have the spoils, we have the castle. He's not saying go take more land. He says, no, go stand on the perimeter and guard the castle. Hold tight, hold firm what I've already given you. So first off, let's go back to last week and let's see what Ephesians 6.12 is all about. We have the same enemy. That is the main point for this morning. I want to spend all of our time talking about how we have the same enemy. Ephesians 6, 10 through 14a. Finally... Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore. And we'll come back after Easter, after we talk about victory of Easter, we'll talk about each piece of the armor that we're going to put on to be able to stand firm. But as I said last week, let's not get carried away on either extreme of this whole conversation on spiritual warfare. On one extreme we go, eh, Chris, this is just for the weird, like, Pentecostal charismatics to talk about angels and demons all the time. Like, that's nothing. That's only for, like, the really evil people. Let's not go to that extreme because that's not what the Bible teaches. And on the other hand, let's, let's not go to this other extreme where there's this odd fascination with the paranormal. Para means next to. Normal means normal. <laughs> You're next to normal. In other words, there's a spiritual realm, and we're on this earthly realm, and we're right here next to it. You cannot avoid it. You can't escape it. Ephesians 6.12 is telling us we live in and around this battle all of the time. It is real. The Bible is filled with references to the paranormal. Angels, demons, heaven, hell. Go on down the list. The whole Bible is about Jesus, but Satan and his evil forces are presented throughout because there's a war. Genesis to Revelation, it's all there. We covered the enemy's names, his attributes, last week. He's a liar, he's a manipulator, he's a thief, he's a killer, he's all these things. Jesus actually referred to him in, in Luke's gospel as being like a strong man who protects his turf. The earth is his turf, and he is out to protect what he thinks this is. In the Old Testament, when, when we hear of the children of Israel falling into pagan worship, he says they sacrifice their children to demons. It doesn't mention the name of the religion, it just says sacrifice to demons. And then in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 10, 
says the Gentiles sacrifice to demons. See, Paul doesn't get specific either. He didn't say, let me tell you about this wrong religion. He says, when you do this stuff, you're sacrificing your children to demons. So while I don't believe there's a demon around every corner, I firmly believe there's a demon behind every lie that has ever been told. Because that's the language of our enemy. Satan told Jesus to bow. He said, bow down and worship me. I'll give you, I've been given the keys. I'll give you the keys. Remember, keys means power and authority. And he says, I I, I don't need to do that. I have all power. I have all all authority. I'm not listening to you. When we looked at our study of Ephesians, we learned that our salvation actually delivered us from the domain of darkness. In the book of Acts, we see that we're delivered from the dominion of Satan and brought into the kingdom of his son, Jesus. And we see that we are told to show kindness to unbelievers. Why? So that they might escape the trap of the devil. This is the word of God. You can't read God's word and think there are not demons and angels. The Bible is teaching us that every single sinful thought has its origins in the work of our enemy in the spiritual realm. There's no good in him. There's nothing good that's ever going to come from him. People ask me, hey, can the devil get saved? Listen, the, the devil, according to God's word, the Satan, his heart is so hardened towards the things of God, he'll never receive forgiveness because that's what he is. That's how dark his heart is. What's the point I'm trying to make then? Paul's point, Ephesians six twelve. We don't fight against flesh and blood. You're not in a battle against flesh and blood. Satan's minions are real and we are at war. Hear me. The Christian life is not like a war. The Christian life is a war. It's real, y'all. It's real. And for all the guys that could have said, no, 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 flesh and blood is evil, it was Paul. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 through 25. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked at night and day and was adrift at sea. And then he goes on for the next few verses and tells all the calamities that came upon him. And he says, and they're not my enemies. They're not the ones that are out. He's writing the book of Ephesians from prison. (laughs) And he says, that's not my enemy either. None of them are my enemies. The enemy is something you can't see. The enemy is out there, but it's an unseen enemy. Church, do you know what this means for Paul and what this means for you and me? It means that your mother-in-law is not your enemy. (laughs) It's truth. She's not your enemy. That person who has articulated this perfectly written rebuttal to your Facebook post is not your enemy. It's truth. The person that voted differently from you is not your enemy. The person who wears a mask, doesn't wear a mask, make sure you wear your mask, is not your enemy. The person that has a different skin color from you is not your enemy. The police are not the enemy. We could go on down the line. I don't know what riles you up. I don't know what stirs you to anger. Fill in the blank. It is not your enemy if it's flesh and blood. Nothing brings us together like fighting against the same enemy. You remember in World War II, we were hardly friendly with Russia. (laughs) But we got together with them to defeat a, a common foe, the Nazis. Now let's, let's, let's go back to last month, something more relevant. Uh, the whole nation became Chiefs fans to defeat the common foe of Tom Brady. Hey, can I get an amen? All right. <laughs> it's funny, though. Like, you can be a neutral and root against somebody, and you can high-five somebody, but it's not quite the same. Like, you, your brackets in the NCAA, you're, like, cheering against somebody. But it's nothing like being a fan and celebrating with a fan. Because when you're a Cardinals fan, you hate the Cubbies. Now, can I get an amen? Come on now. That'll preach. We are on God's side, and we have the same enemy that God has. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy, according to John 10.10. But Jesus came that we have life, and that it may flourish, that it may be abundant and full. And I'm telling you, Satan is working hard to destroy our unity. He is coming against us to ruin friendships, 
to kill our churches, to kill our family relationships. He wants to destroy our witness as storytellers of the greatest story known to man, that salvation comes through Jesus. And since we know that that's the objective of the enemy, we need to just realize, okay, if he wants destruction and division, I believe it is critical, church, right now that we as followers of Jesus choose the cross as our highest loyalty. That's where we gather for unity. We meet there. That's where we pledge our allegiance. We come to the cross as a group of people and say, you know what? It's not my political affiliation. It's not my preferences on current events. I meet at the cross with other believers, and that's where we stake our claim. Amen. God gives you the Spirit of God so that we can listen to his voice, not that we would follow the philosophies of this broken world. You may not like it. You may not see it. You may think I'm a weirdo for being up here talking about demons and angels, and I get that. But the Bible deals with it plainly. There is no distinction weaving in and out of the spiritual realm and the natural realm as you read God's word. Eve's just there in the garden doing what she's supposed to do, enjoying the garden, having life in the natural realm, and just like that, supernatural, the devil walks in holding something that belongs to God and tempting Eve to partake of a gift that he's not supposed to give to her. Natural to supernatural, smooth. We see it flow very simply from the disciples. Jesus says, you can go cast out demons. They're like, we can? Yeah, go do it. So they go do it. <laughs> it's just natural. It's a part of it. When, when Jesus is in the garden and he's being arrested, the disciples want to fight back. They want to have that kind of war. And he says, whoa, hold up, y'all. Because if I wanted a war, I just watched 70,000 plus angels draw their swords. It was real to him. Jesus saw things that you and I don't see, but he wants us to see it. And let me make this promise. Once you see it, you'll never unsee it. When you begin to see things in the spiritual realm like this, you'll never not see it again. The great picture that we get in the Old Testament is in the book of Job. Have you ever read this? It's an interesting little book. We get to see it from God's eyes. But did you know Job never mentions the devil? He never mentions seeing anything in the spiritual realm. We get the outside perspective to kind of see what happened. But there's this conversation that's going on, right? God's here and Satan shows up and God looks at him and says, where have you been? And he says, I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. If you didn't hear that in Johnny Cash's voice, <laughs> you need to find another church. Um, I'm just messing with you. But, but no, seriously, Satan is Roman ranks. Where have you been? I've been all over the place, and I've just been messing with your people, and it's easy. And God says, well, have you thought about my servant Job? <laughs> he says, yeah, I know your servant Job. I know him by name. I know what he's all about. But I'm going to tell you something, God, I, I think he worships you because you've made life easy on him. You've given him everything. Why don't you take your hand of blessing off of him and let's see what happens. In fact, in verse 11, listen to what it says. It says, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand only against him. Do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. It's frightening to think of a conversation like that actually taking place. It's one thing to think of it in Job. Have you thought about that maybe over your life? What moments have happened over your life? And understand this. The story of Job is interesting because it's not about Job. You know what it's about? God. <laughs> and your story, by the way, is not about you. And that's not to say that you don't matter. You do. You matter to God. You matter greatly to God. But the story of Job and the story of you is about God. And it is this conflict between the angelic and the satanic realm. And it is a real battle that is always going on. You and I just need to become aware of it. Now, if you were really aware of it, what would change in your life? Probably a few things, right? He knows, though, that we can't handle to see the full picture, so he gives us just a glimpse of it. What's fascinating, too, is at the end of the story, Job is twice the man that he was at the beginning of the story. If he loses it all, there's this great battle taking place over him. He doesn't even know that Satan is a player in the story, and yet he just remains faithful to God. He can't see the battle. His friends couldn't see the battle, but his friends are speaking of what they think they see. But that's what Satan does. He drives a wedge between relationships. He wants to disrupt unity. And we have to stay focused on God. Job prevailed 
even though he wasn't perfect because God was faithful. This stuff can be tough. It can just be tough to talk about. I don't want to talk about this, if I'm being honest. I really don't. And I'll tell you, even as I prepared this over the last couple of weeks, I have felt the battle raging. It has been very real to me over the last couple of weeks. And as I started thinking about how I felt, I started thinking about what would be going on in this room this morning as I preached on this. What kind of battles are going on in a way that we can't even see that the enemy wants to keep you from hearing this word from God? Have you ever thought about that? I have already noticed in the last two weeks how relationally, every relationship that I have seems to have a greater tension having opened up this can of worms. Is that a coincidence? Because I don't think it is. And yet I know that that's what our enemy wants to do. He wants to beat us up and he wants to separate us. Why? Because how does the Bible describe us? We're called sheep. That's a fascinating creature. It's kind of an insult right now in the current state of things, right? To be, called a, to be called sheep? Well, guess what? You're sheep. That's what the Bible says that you are. They're the only defenseless, helpless animal in the entire animal kingdom. They, I mean, they can't dig. They can't run. They can't jump. They can't fly. They don't even have a stink gland to kind of ward off, you know, enemies. My wife's are really like, well, I think I know one. But uh, anyway, I should stick to my notes. I really should. Um, but they're not camouflaged. They're, they're white. They're, 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 they're snow white in a green pasture. They can't hide. They are 100% symbiotic upon man. Sheep need a shepherd. And while I'm calling you sheep, understand this, you strong, powerful, independent woman that you are. You need a shepherd. You studly, strong, independent man. You need a shepherd. And that's just the truth of the matter. But there's a good news that comes from God's word. You have a good shepherd, and he loves you very much. In fact, he wants to keep you from the domain of the wolves. Listen to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is, is not from God, this is the, the spirit of the Antichrist. All right, if you don't confess God, then that's the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Let's not forget that there was a little seed planted in the garden Right? I mentioned last week that while God created this beautiful Garden of Eden for us to enjoy life, to enjoy all of his creation, it was spoiled by a rotten seed, by an invasive species. The enemy planted a seed of dishonesty, a lie. Remember what I said? He doesn't even have to work that hard. Why? Because we're happy to keep spreading the lie. His work was almost done when he planted the seed. We've been replanting and sending it out for thousands of years. And when I said that, that's not to say that Satan is not powerful. That is to say, remember whose side you're on. Your God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. Satan is not. However, I'm not saying that Satan is not powerful. He's just not all-powerful. So there is a dangerous enemy out there, and we need to know that he's working hard to keep that invasive species going. See, when I was a kid, I had no idea that honeysuckle was an invasive species. Did you know that? That was like my favorite plant as a little boy. I'd go to my grandparents' house, and along their clothesline on each pole was honeysuckle growing up out of it. I love the smell of it. Can you smell it right now? It's awesome, you know? And I'd, I'd pluck the flower and pull the fruit out from under the petals. And you remember, did you ever do this? Get that little drop of nectar? Love that. I'd do it over and over and over again. I had no idea. It didn't belong there. That sounds just like our enemy, right? Hand you just a little bit of fruit and make you wish you had a little bit more. Being somewhere it's not supposed to be. 
doing something that's actually choking out the native plants that belong there, actually choking out the entire ecosystem because it's not indigenous to this area. That's Satan. That's why Jesus said, don't worry, I'm going to create a new heaven and I'm going to create a new earth. We need to understand there's only one way to get rid of an invasive species. That's to pull it all up and throw it in the fire. That's what God has set out to do with our enemy. So what do we do? James says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. How do, how do we get the devil to flee? Submit to God. Well, how do we do that? Know his word. His word is the driving force of your life. You don't toy around with untruth. You root it out like weeds so that the, the truth can grow within you. This stuff is real, and God knows that, and that's why he wants you to be in his word. That's why he wants you sitting here in his presence so that you can walk by the Spirit. But our enemy is always coming against us. Ephesians 3.10 said, We have been given this salvation for what purpose? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers. Here's those words again and authorities in the heavenly places. In the angelic realm, that is a, that is a real thing with real beings that have a, a real order. The cosmic powers that are over this cosmic darkness, there's, there are the angelic beings who are fighting those demonic forces, and there's a war taking place there. We know that Michael was the archangel, that, that Gabriel was set over Israel to protect Israel as a warrior. We also know from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, that angels, it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who inherit salvation? Now, some have taken that to mean that we each have a guardian angel. I don't know that I really buy into that theology, but I was thinking, man, God, if that's real, when I go to heaven, I can't wait to meet that guy. Because I'm going to come up and just hug that angel and be like, thank you for all the times you saved me for my stupidity, right? And I'm going to duck at the same time because he's probably going to want to punch me, right? If I have a guardian angel, I certainly kept it busy. I, I don't, again, I don't know if I buy into that, but my point is this. There is an order to the angelic realm, and they have a purpose to fight on our behalf. And there's also an order to the demonic side. You do know our enemy has a strategy, right? That this is also real, that, that he is not just kind of winging it. In fact, I love in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, it says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me for 21 days, but Michael... One of the chief princes came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So you got, you got Daniel praying, and he's like, what's going on, God? Three weeks? And all of a sudden, yeah, yeah, Michael had to come help out the battle because it was real. Can you imagine there being a demon over an entire nation or maybe assigned to a specific king? But do you understand that there is order to the chaos of sin before Christ returns, lies, errors, manipulation, fear, all these things are being spread. This invasive species is going out, and it is wild. In the meantime, church, you and I are called to stand. Like, why are we shrinking back? Why aren't we talking about this stuff? So while I believe Satan's lies are being spread like wildfire by humans, I'm also recognizing that his forces are stoking and fanning that flame. And so when I think about things like abortion, I know that there's a demon or maybe many assigned to that topic. When I think of human sexuality, I wonder how many demonic forces have been throwing these sinful creative ideas towards humanity throughout the years. I think about specific regions around the world. I think about certain false religions and go, there's a demon behind that train of thought, behind atheism and agnosticism. This is all planned out. And for us to not acknowledge that is to be naive. This is coming from like an old Baptist boy. Like, I, I mean, help me out here a little bit. I'm out of my territory here. But I know it's in God's word. This is real. This stuff is real. And so the Spirit of God will lead you into this, to guide you into this. But you and I have got to learn to ask the question, God, are you in this? That sounds right. That feels right. That could be true. But if it's not him and we don't know it by his word and by his character, what do we do with it? Get rid of it. Don't touch it. Remember, in, our enemy appears like an angel of light. 
He disguises himself as good. The Spirit of God will lead you to know if Jesus is in it or not. This is how you stand firm, is by sitting with him and walking with him. 1 John chapter 4, again, verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Because every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in, uh, that has come in the flesh uh, is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is not from God, that is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. You know the Bible warns us against false teachers and false teaching, correct? You know this to be true. How do you know? <laughs> you judge them by their fruit. What are they producing? Whatever philosophies, whatever conversations are going on, if they do not acknowledge Christ as the answer, throw it away. Plain and simple. That's just how it works. That is the most basic question any Christian can ask. Is God's word true in this? And John tells us that any spirit that does not acknowledge or promote his heart is the Antichrist. Christians, can I help you with something? Because I know a lot of people get fascinated with end times conversations. Who is the Antichrist? You're asking the wrong question. What are the Antichrists? Start looking for what is Antichrist instead of looking for who is the Antichrist. Does that make sense? Look for things that are adamantly opposed to God and stay away from that. Any spirit that does not acknowledge him and manifest his character is wrong. Church, we are at war, and it is not left versus right. It is truth versus lies. We are in war, and it is, it is not straight versus gay. It is, it is truth, rather, truth versus lies. It is not white versus black. It is the unity of Christ and, and the division of the devil. We could go on and on and on, but we have all these wrong thinkings about what is wrong with the world, and we're fighting the wrong battles. And he says, your fight is not against flesh and blood. Quit trying to put it in human systems. This is the only answer. We meet at the cross, and we show people who Jesus is. And that's First John 4, 6, for we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Okay, so you see, now we're getting somewhere. How do we stand firm together? Love. Love. You want to judge it by the fruits? What is it producing? Is it producing love out of you? The Bible is telling us, that our, our, our movement is not centered on anything other than the person of Jesus. His work on the cross. His job of reconciling humanity to one another and to himself. So here's my point. When you and I engage in disunity, when you and I engage in hatred, when you and I engage in man-made attempts to fix humans' problems, then we've switched teams. We're not playing for God anymore. We're not. We, we've changed uniforms. We're, we're playing in the hands of the enemy. Yeah, but it feels right. It sounds right. I think I'm doing right. Your feelings are letting you down. Live by the truth. If our enemy has planted an invasive species in the garden, you've got to say, well, what fruit is it bearing? Because right now we have people in this country that just want to cancel everything. And I don't bring that up to rile you up this morning. But understand this, that Jesus would rather heal things than cancel things. Jesus would rather listen than demand. Jesus would rather listen than threaten. And he would rather forgive than demand. So understand this. I think we're pretty tempted in this room to get irritated with cancel culture. Can I turn it back on you? Are you canceling a lost world? Have you created an us versus them paradigm that doesn't exist in the Bible? Because Paul said, no, 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 you don't fight against flesh and blood. You're fighting against evil things that are driving people to do things. Those people that you're tempted to hate because they think differently than you, they're canceling things that you love, they're frustrating you, they're voting differently. God has called you to them. Do you know this is true? Oh, I know I'm stepping on toes because I stepped on mine this week. It hurts. But we have to remember, God didn't call us to be angry. He called us to love. 
He called us to go. Many so-called Christians are gobbling up these worldviews and philosophies that are coming from anything other than Christ, and they don't realize that it doesn't line up with God's Word. Don't you do it on the other end. So what fruit are we supposed to produce? Oh, you know them, right? Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Did I get off? Patience, faithfulness, self-control. I messed up one in there somewhere. It's in my notes. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Church, I, I would love right now to go through every one of the fruit of the Spirit and explain how this works. But I've probably gone too long already. No, you want me to keep going? All right, I'll do them all. Um, I won't. Let's just do one. Let's just do love. Because when we think of the fruit of love and it actually flowing out of the Spirit, because we've been sitting here, we've been walking by the Spirit, and we're standing firm. When we think about that true love, what's the opposite of that? What's, what's the invasive copycat of that? Somebody might say hate or anger, right? You might even say, it's, well, it's apathy. It's that I don't care. I'm indifferent. And I think that's probably even, even closer to a true definition of being the opposite. But let me help you to understand something. Satan is not producing opposites. He's not trying to create the, the exact polar opposite of what love is. No, no, no. He wants it to be as close and copycat to the original as possible. So what does he do? He creates a sort of faux love, faux peace, faux joy. And again, I'm only talking about love, right? So if I look at faux love, what is that? Well, for example, let's say that I've just been a horrible father to my children. I'm just being, I've just checked out, not doing a good job raising them. But then I start feeling kind of guilt and shame. So now I'm going to overcompensate and I'm going to just give them whatever they want. I'm just acknowledging my, my horrible job of parenting. By now I'm just showering blessings on them, giving them whatever they want. Is that love? No, that's the worst thing I could ever do for my children. True love is that I lay down my life to serve them and to actually be their dad, right? To spend time with them. You see, the enemy wants to produce a sort of faux fruit that looks just like the original. And that's what he set out to do to destroy this world. So when we look at the fruits of the Spirit, understand this. God has called us to stand firm for the world, not against the world. So let me kind of end with these two thoughts. First, we stand firm for the world because nothing energizes the church like joining together on mission. We stand firm because the world is lost and in desperate need of Jesus. So when I think about the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he says, and Jesus said to them, all power and authority. Now, again, there's warfare language. You're on the high ground. You own it. All power, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And go, therefore, go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. Do you see this? Sit here with them in the presence of Jesus. Show them what the Word of God actually says so that, so that they can go up from here and walk so they can obey everything I've commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you to the end of the age. That's what we're called to do. We are saved for the world, not to be ticked off at the world. The mission of the church is to save souls through Christ. That's what we do. We are called to tell the story. That is our calling. And when we do that in unity by the Spirit, church, we're unstoppable. Does the church feel unstoppable right now? It feels pretty weak, if I'm being honest. So what have we lost? What are we buying into? Whose truth are we believing? God has given us a pretty good truth. He showed us what love is in John 13, 34 through 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you is that you love one another. Just as I've loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So if we have a lost world that has no interest in the church, maybe the question we need to ask is this, how are we loving? How are we loving each other? And how are we loving those people that are lost and who are outside of us? Because God didn't call us to be us versus them. It was us for them. 
church, in this season of our lives, when the world is so divided, there's no way forward but for us to live by the love of Christ. Let's explore it. Let's jump into it. Let's go all in for it. Would you stand with me? I'm going to leave you with this final thought, that we are also then called to stand firm, not just for the world, but also for each other, the church. This is our family, church. We've been bought by the blood of Christ. We should stand firm together and know what truth is and let truth be the driving force of our life. Romans 12, 5, so we, though many, are the body of Christ and individually members of one another. I belong to you. You belong to me. We are stronger together as long as this is what bonds us together. Romans 15, 5 through 7, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that you may with one voice glorify God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Last question. Are you welcoming people into the family of God? Not just people that look like you, think like you, dress like you. Are you willing to welcome all people into this place? into a relationship with Christ. That is our calling. That's why Christ died. And that's the battle that's going on around you. The enemy doesn't want you welcoming people in. He wants you to continue to put up walls of division and hostility. Are you ready to stand? Father, help us. Help us, Lord Jesus.